uh, example 5.6 on page 125. I'll read the example. It says, a car of mass M is on an icy driveway inclined at an angle of theta, as shown in the figure. A, find the acceleration of the car, assuming that the driveway is frictionless. And B, suppose the car is released from rest at the top of the incline and the distance from the car's front bumper to the bottom of the incline is D. How long does it take the front bumper to reach the bottom? And what is the car's speed as it arrives there? So I've kind of I've driven, I've uh, drawn uh, what's given here. Uh, we've got a car on an icy road. It means there's no friction on this road at all. It's inclined at theta. It, oh, it has a mass of m. Although the mass isn't really going to matter here. And uh, we're a distance d from the end of the driveway. And we're starting from rest. And we want to know what's the acceleration of the car. What is, how much time does it take? And how fast are we going at the bottom? So let's uh, solve this. Well, I need to follow the procedure because I, I need to know what an acceleration is by looking at the forces acting on the car. Let me zoom in a little bit. So I'm going to follow the procedure, and this was step one, right? To draw what was given, you know, use given, find, and solve, draw a picture, and show what's given around that picture. Okay, now step two is to uh, draw the uh, free body diagram of the object. So the object of interest is the car. So here's the car. And what uh, what is acting on the car? What, what agents, what outside agents are applying forces to the car? Gravity. And gravity always pulls straight down towards the center of the earth. Now I always uh, write it as gravity as m times g. The mass times gravitational field which is 9.8 newtons, newtons of force per kilogram of mass. If I have a kilogram of mass gravity will pull down with 9.8 newtons of force here on earth. So that's how strong earth's gravity field is and uh, so that's how I'm going to write it. Now, this surface here has an interaction with the car as well. But it's an icy surface. And we're assuming there's no friction. If there's no friction. There's no way for this surface to apply a force along this direction, along the direction of the plane. But, the, but it can apply a force perpendicular to it. And, of course, we call that the normal force. And we'll draw it like that. There's our normal force. And that's it, folks. Nobody is pushing on it. There's no applied force. There's no tension force. Uh, there's nothing like that. Th these are the only two forces acting. Well, then step three is to identify our axis system and then break our forces into their components. All right, I'm just following the steps of the procedure. So it's usually a good idea to make your x-axis, or sometimes your y-axis, but usually your x-axis, in the direction of the known acceleration. We know this car is going to accelerate down the driveway, so I'm going to make down the driveway the positive x direction. And then, of course, the y direction will be perpendicular to the x direction or normal okay and so uh, now I need to break up the forces into their components but look at the normal force the normal force is in the y direction it has no x component but now look at gravity gravity needs to be broken up into its components and, it, and the components need to be in the y direction and the x direction. So here's gravity. 
And this is the component in the y direction. And there's the component in the x direction here. The x component and the y component of my force of gravity. Make sure you draw it so that the y component of gravity and the x component of gravity are perpendicular to each other, like that. Now, here's the thing that throws some students off. The normal, uh, well, here's my angle of incline. I have rotated up from the horizontal up like this. So in a way, the normal force, which would normally be, normally, would be pointed like this, has been rotated from the vertical that much. So you can think of it as going like that. So, so it's been rotated up by theta. So if this is my angle of incline, theta, that theta in this right triangle is on this uh, on this corner vertex or what do you call it? Okay. Is that clear to everybody that the angle is right here? Okay, it's not over here, it's up here. And that's absolutely critical to solving the rest of this problem. So this rotates up. Well, now I can express my components in terms of the weight, mg, and the angle of incline theta. This is the adjacent, this, this makes a right triangle. mg is the hypotenuse. This is the adjacent leg, and the way we get the adjacent leg is to multiply the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle. And therefore, this is the hypotenuse times the sine of the angle. And what throws students off is it's kind of weird because normally we think of the x component of a vector as being like the magnitude times the cosine of the angle. But look where this angle theta is measured from. It's measured from the vertical, not from the horizontal. If I gave you these vectors in polar coordinates, I would measure theta from the positive x direction. But it's not being measured from the positive x direction. In fact, it's rotated up from the vertical. So the cosine and the sine essentially get flipped. Uh, in any case, always let the right triangle tell you when to use sine and when to use cosine. So, now I move on to step four. I will sum the forces in the x direction. That will be equal to ma in the x direction. This is, this is telling me what to do. So I'm going to look in the x direction. What forces on my free body diagram are in the x direction? There's only one. This component of weight mg sine theta. And that will be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And I said it earlier, but notice that the mass of the car cancels out of the equation and now we're done. We, we now do step five. We solve for the unknown. It's already solved for. The acceleration of the car will be equal to the acceleration of gravity but times the sine of the angle of incline. And there's my answer. This makes sense. What if the angle of incline was zero? Okay, what is the sine of zero? Zero. If the angle of incline was zero, there would be no component of gravity to accelerate you. Gravity doesn't work sideways. What if the angle were 90 degrees? What if the angle were 90 degrees? Oh, that would be a that would be a very difficult driveway to navigate because now you're just pulling out of your, your garage and falling off a cliff. 
and your car would accelerate at a rate of 9.8 meters per second every second to the, to the street below. But we're in between. What this is saying is that my acceleration will be due to gravity, but only a component of gravity. Only a part of gravity is available when you're on a hill. And this makes total sense. If you've ever ridden a bike or skateboarded or gone skiing, you know the steeper the slope, the more gravity is available to pull you down. And you're going to accelerate faster until you go off a cliff. And then you're accelerating as fast as gravity can accelerate you. So this makes sense. So that's my answer for part A. Now for part B, now it just becomes a kinematics problem. Um, I want to know the time it takes to get from here to here. What do I know? Uh, I know the distance. I know the initial velocity. I know the acceleration. I don't know the final velocity. And I'll, I don't you know, need to find it yet. So I'm going to use the uh, third kinematic equation, delta x equals v naught t plus one half a t squared. Delta x we're calling d. V naught is zero. One half, and then we know acceleration is g sine theta times t squared. All I need to do now is solve for t. t is equal to two times d divided by g sine theta, where theta is my angle of incline, and then I'll need to take the square root. Now I want to know my final velocity. Uh, well, let's see, can I fit it over here? Uh, yeah, let's fit it over here. Well, um, I, I could, I'll just use the fourth kinematic equation. There's my fourth kinematic equation. Uh, I know this is zero. V is equal to the square root of two times A, but A is G sine theta, and delta X we're calling D. And that's probably good enough. I can leave it like that. And did I do it right? Yes, indeed I did. Okay, so let's zoom all the way out here and take a look at the whole thing. And that's it. That is all.